I would like to introduce our guests. I'm very happy to be here, not only because I'm a Barcelona football club fan and have natural <laughs> um, inclination to like everything that comes from Barcelona and Catalonia, but also because um, I'm the editor of the Best European Fiction series of the Dalek Archive Press, in which I was proud to include uh, Catalan letters, and which is also published by the Dalek Archive the Dalky Archive Press, which has a series of Catalan writers. Um, I also believe that, um, believe in translation as a process of literary creation, not just um, simple translation. Every translator is a recreator. Um, and a situation of Catalan literature, about which I guess we'll be talking about, is sort of conducive to translation in more ways than once. So allow me then to present our guests. Um, on my left is Enric Bo. He's a professor and chair of Hispanic studies at Brown University. Um, he seems to know quite a bit about Catalan literature. He uh, is the author of Critical Panorama of Catalan Literature and also a dictionary. Uh, he edited a dictionary in 2000 of Catalan literature. Next to him is Mary Ann Newman, the director of the Catalan Center at NYU and a translator who has translated the works of Xavier Robert de Ventos and uh, Narcisse Conadira. Uh, next to, to Mary is uh, Teresa Solana, a Solana sorry, translator and a writer. Um, her most recent book in English is The Shortcut to Paradise. Um, her first book, uh, whose name just escapes me now, was uh, the best, what, what was the name of your first book? An answer for Frank. It was the best noir novel in Catalan not so long ago. Um, and to her left is Peter Bush, a translator, former director of the British Center for Literary Translation, who lives in Barcelona now and who translates from uh, Spanish, Catalan, Portuguese, and French, uh, and who also translated Teresa Solana's uh, book, A Shortcut to Paradise, and some others, I would think. Um, and he translated some other books. Um, including Juan, uh, Juan Bortisola's Exile from Almost Everywhere, and uh, Alan Badon's uh, Book in Praise of Love, and many other books. Um, I have had the pleasure of meeting him um, also. To cut a long story short, I suggest this format for this evening. First, Enric and Mary will talk about Catalan literature. Teresa and Peter will read um, from some works of Catalan literature, whereupon we will open um, this panel for your questions um, and discussion. If you agree with that, oh. I will give my word to Andy <coughs> Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this uh, panel. And thank you uh, to everybody for being here. Uh, I assume uh, what I'm going to do is a very brief uh, uh, presentation. Particular, uh, what I wanted to do is uh, present the, the problem, some of the problems uh, dealing with the context with the, of the two authors we are doing uh, here in this session, which are uh, either recently translated or that are, are about to be translated, like uh, Lorenz Villalonga and uh, Josep Bach, who are major figures in uh, Catalan literature, in European literature, I should say. And, uh, excuse me, uh, there's a few who already know a lot, and this is basically maybe the, then in the, in the discussion we can I can go uh, more in, in depth and discuss more in depth some of the general aspects that we have to discuss here. Uh, what I basically what I wanted to say is as a, as a, a context for these two offers, Josep Pla and Lorenzo Vidalonga, is that uh, this has particularly the, the situation and the, the, some of the problematics of uh, Catalan literature that comes from a very small country in the northeast of Spain, a country without a state, but uh, who's had, is a small country, but has had uh, throughout the years a big literature. And this may have uh, been so because of the of historical uh, situations in the Middle Ages, uh, together at the Aragon and Catalonia had a small empire in the Mediterranean, uh, uh, this may help explain the um, prestige, the development of literature after the imitation of the Italian models. And so, so this explains to us that there was a, a, a 
David, a very rich and medieval literature, no? uh, with authors such as Roman Lewis, Osias Mark, uh, etc. Students of uh, medieval literature in, in this country and other countries uh, all, always have to go uh, at one point in Roman language departments, but at one point or another to Catalan authors. Uh, but uh, Catalonia went through a political moral crisis uh, and uh, uh, for, for many years and uh, for many centuries. Sorry, and it was in, in, in during the 19th and 20th century where their ex a revival was experienced. A revival that uh, situated language, the reco uh, recovery of the, the use of the language, the recovery of the of the uh, culture or high culture uh, use of, uh, of the language in literature at the center <laughs> of the discussion. And, uh, um, and also to the culture of our political activities. There was in the mid 19th century started a movement called Renascenza, Rebirth, literally. And uh, that was, uh, it was a dual movement, a political and cultural literary, uh, literary movement. This uh, m movement of Renascenza, Rebirth, uh, uh, open up the doors for at the turn of the century, the 19th to the 20th century, the possibility of uh, 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 of uh, uh, getting uh, closer to um, a modern or current European trends of the moment. I always tell to my students something. I make a comparison. Uh, the most important author in 19th century Catalan literature was a priest called Jacinto Verdague who by the end of the 19th century was writing what the French were writing at the beginning of uh, uh, the 19th century, which is uh, epic poems. No? It's most known, better known the poem is La Atlantida, which is a recreation of the lost mythical uh, land that in um, theory is under the Atlantic under the ocean. Atl Atlantic ocean. Uh, <coughs> if we go a little bit to the a little bit further, uh, we find authors that uh, are comparable to uh, to the French uh, uh, symbolist uh, poetry and literature. And by the early 20th century, we run into authors that are maybe ahead of what was the main European uh, cultural literary trend at the moment. I'm thinking, for example, in terms of uh, Salvador Dali, you know, whose writings uh, make um, transform dramatically what have been a uh, almost boring surrealist literature, if we compare them. Uh, so uh, then there, there are, uh, besides Renaissance, I refer, there are other uh, literary movements, group of artists such as uh, uh, under the name of Modernisme, modern style, Art Nouveau, uh, and, and Gaudi, the well, very well known uh, architect, would be the equivalent of uh, Joan Maragall and other authors uh, in, literary, in the literary field. Or uh, there is also a, another movement called No Santisma, uh, 19th uh, century. 20th century. 20th century, it was quite. Uh, sorry, yes. And uh, with authors off such as Eugenie Dors, from uh, Marianne uh, Niemann, <laughs> has studied uh, for many years. So, uh, what, I'm, what I'm trying to, to present here is that there is this uh, progress towards uh, normality. That uh, it's, uh, it takes place, it's finally, it's, uh, assume, and, and at the, in the 1930s, but at the wrong moment historically, because this is when uh, the Spanish Civil War breaks uh, up, and this is the end of the possibility of uh, publishing, writing, etc. in Catalan. You know, for many years, until the 1950s, maybe the 1960s, there are no more uh, public life, uh, authorized life, uh, literary activities. So the two authors we are discussing, we are discussing here in this panel uh, are authors that start uh, are typically of a certain generation. Both were born in 1897, at the end of the 19th century, and uh, start writing before uh, World uh, Civil War, the Civil War, and uh, already become popular, well known. And uh, both their literary careers, their it is the what they write is. Uh, dramatically uh, influenced by uh, the Civil War experience. Uh, Giuseppe Pla was a journalist <coughs> who, uh, 
he used to say that he had to live two lives. No? One as a cosmopolitan journalist that would travel the world, Europe, and for him. <laughs> and, uh, well, this was after the war. Uh, he, he would uh, have these uh, adventures, or write these uh, chronicles uh, in uh, Italy. He, was, he, he witnessed the entrance to, uh, of uh, Mussolini to Rome. He was in Madrid at the time of uh, the beginning of uh, the, the Second Spanish Republic. He was in Berlin interviewing uh, Hitler and other uh, high-ranking officials of the Nazi regime, etc., etc. And he's uh, very well known because of his uh, uh, journalistic uh, contributions to the press, not the main, the most important uh, uh, newspapers at the time. But that's because of his writing of a, some, this sort of uh, long journal, literary journal, a personal journal. Uh, a journal he started in uh, 1918 and that finished in 1981 when he died. No? And his, uh, he has a, uh, his complete works are more than 50 volumes and all are like variations of this uh, journal. And uh, the, the journal, this Quadern Gris of the Grey Notebook, that Peter Bush is translating is a sensational book, sensational book, which is a fake. It, uh, it's a fake in, in the sense that uh, it was written in 1918 uh, when he was a uh, college student at the University of Barcelona, and it, it was it, it was only a few, I mean, uh, hundred pages or so. But a few years ago, that they published the, the manuscript or a facsimile of the manuscript. But the, the final version, which he rewrote in 1966, 66 is more than uh, 700 pages. So obviously he rewrote the whole thing, he, and, and it's uh, an extraordinary uh, review, um, reflection, a set of reflections on literature, literature of the time, literature in general, devoted uh, to his models, Stendhal, Marcel Proust, uh, other, Berlake uh, and other ethnic authors, and uh, also uh, uh, an extraordinary uh, depiction of uh, landscape, uh, the effects of landscape, uh, the world changed in the weather, etc., etc. The other author, Lorenzo Villalonga, he was a psychiatrist, again, also born in 1897, uh, he died in 1980. There are parallels in this respect. Who uh, was a psychiatrist by training, uh, a, a good lover of French culture, an admirer of uh, Marcel Proust, who had already published before the Spanish War some uh, very critical, uh, a novel, very critical of. Uh, Mallorca, he was from Mallorca, like the island of Mallorca, and very critical of, of uh, Mores and, uh, and uh, the, the status quo and, uh, and the society in Alma, Mallorca. And after the war, he wrote this extraordinary novel, it's called De Arno, Nova Sala Las Minas, who has just been translated by, by Dolphin. Uh, a novel who has been, uh, thank you, <laughs> who has been uh, compared to uh, 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 Giovanni Tomasi de Lampedusa's uh, The Gepard. No? Uh, it's a very, the novel may be more or less known for, to an American audience. The film by Lucchino Visconti, I'm sure most of you have seen. It's uh, comparable in the sense that it's uh, located in this remote island, uh, this, in this case in the middle, middle, uh, middle of the 19th century. And he's very critical with uh, the backwardness of the society. Lives in, in. So this is just briefly what I what I first present, and then maybe Marianne is going to add some more. Thank you, Alex. So thank you very much. Well, um, <laughs> I would like to thank Penn for um, coming up with the topic of the modern tradition because. I think this is the basis of, uh, of Kabbalah, our modern Kabbalah literature, which is searching for a balance between tradition and modern. Um, this is a very logical process uh, for a culture that, as Enrique has already told us, flourished in the Middle Ages and early Renaissance and then languished for three centuries until it reemerged in the 19th century. And as Enrique has also pointed out, in the space of about 20 years, Catalan literature goes, in the 19th century, Catalan literature goes from romanticism to symbolism to modernism to avant-garde, practically. And, and um, 
The funny thing is that I'm going to be going over some ground that Enrique has gone over, but I think from a slightly different point of view. But because of this gap, and then, of course, the, the other gaps, the Civil War, etc., we always feel the need to go back to the origins when we, uh, when we talk about Catalan literature, because most people don't have that kind of information. So one of the things we should make clear is that Catalan literature is not only the literature of Catalonia. Catalan literature is literature written in the Catalan language. And that includes the Balearic Islands, which is where Villalonga is from, Mallorca, Menorca, Ibiza, and Valencia, and the Rusinone in France, the south of France, and part of, uh, part of Italy. So um, there are actually writers writing in the south of France right now as well. Juan um, Luis Luis and Jean Daniel Bezonov are really, really excellent writers. So, it's a, it's a broader map than you might think. I'm going to talk right now mostly about Catalonia and the Balearic Islands, which if you look at them on a map of Spain, uh, you might wonder what all the fuss is about. Uh, Catalonia is a small triangle in the northeast corner of the Iberian Peninsula, uh, which borders on Andorra and France and is defined geographically by the Pyrenees in the north and the Mediterranean to the east. And as Enrique has already pointed out, landscape in Pla, but really in, in many, many authors, is a very, very important part of, of the literature. Um, the Pyrenees actually meet the Mediterranean at Puerto La Selva, so it's a kind of a mythic uh, conjuncture there. Catalonia occupies 32,000 square kilometers, um, and the Balearic Island, um, uh, 4,992, so this is about 17% of Spain's 505,000 kilometers. Uh, the population is nearly 7 million in Catalonia, and the Balearic, Balearic Islands is 800,000. But this is important to state because, of course, there are languages and literatures that have far fewer speakers that uh, have the support of a federal government, a central government that that is able to export them. So since language and politics, as we always see in the World Voices Festival so often, uh, always come together, this is uh, something to keep in mind. In any case, this is also a good place to recall uh, Jose Saramago's phrase, um, there are many small countries, but there are no small cultures. Now, what Catalan, I'm going to speak a little broadly about Catalan culture in the, because what most people know about Catalan culture tends to derive from the visual. Um, and Unamuno was one of the people who pointed this out, Miguel de Unamuno, the Spanish author, because he says, Levantines, you are drowning in aesthetics. But it is this visual, mm, the importance of the visual that, that also defines a lot of Catalan culture. Um, what people tend to know about it is the architecture, uh, Gaudí and Domenico Montenegro, Modernis Modernismo, the Gothic architecture. Um, this is present both in Barcelona and in, in Mallorca, in Palma in particular. The Arribo and the, um, is, is quite, and the Gothic are quite um, important there. Um, in music, the names that, of course, in the in the arts, Dali, Miró, Picasso and his Picasso period, we can say that now, even though Picasso wasn't born in Barcelona, but the Metropolitan established that he had his Catalan period. Uh, and of course, uh, Dali. The, and music, in music, which also once again doesn't require translation, we have Casals, Albenis, Granados, Montsalvatge, and Montpau, who the, when they play him on the American radio, people insist on calling Montpau because they seem to think he's French. But in any case, um, all of these, the visual arts, all art requires interpretation, but of course literature also requires translation, and it's a, uh, a great deal more um, costly uh, or more difficult to, to get across. And it also requires frequent translations, and translations every 25 or 30 years, and one, that's another another point. So all of the arts boast other um, outstanding and, no, and some invisible Catalan names, some of them very visible. Some of them are invisible in the sense that people know Gaudí, Dalí, 
etc., but they don't necessarily know them as Kalwan. So, um, and in liter literature is first among them as well. Uh, as all small non-English speaking countries are aware, translation is the great bugbear. It is crucial to understand that for every Gaudi building, Tapia's painting, or Granada's composition, there is a novel, a poem, a short story, or a play. But unlike their counterparts, they require our midwives, Peter Bush is one of the principal among them. Um, so when Catalan culture reemerges in the 19th century, it has a wealth of tradition to look back upon, well, traditions to look back upon. There, uh, Catalan has a chivalric tradition, um, uh, there, uh, so there would be a courtly love tradition to look back on, which in fact is mined more by, by the Spanish tradition. We have more the, the Don Juans and the Don Quixotes and all of that. Uh, the Catalan uh, courtly love tradition would be represented to a certain extent by Tirano Lo Blanc, which uh, one of the great Catalan uh, medieval critics, Martí de Riquet, said, distinguishes from a chivalric novel by calling it a chivalrous novel because Tirano Blanc dies in his bed. It's the first chivalric novel that, in fact, is actually trying, tending toward realism and toward comedy. So when Catalan literature reemerges, uh, when Catalan literature, I'm sorry, goes into dormancy, um, in, and it's important to know that at the time that the Spanish uh, crown is unifying Spain, Catalonia suffers a triple whammy of famine, plague, and an economic downturn and recession. And in addition, uh, the last member of the dynasty dies. So Ferdinand, of, of Ferdinand and Isabel Fane, who is the king of Aragon, becomes, becomes the representative of Catalonia, but he is not Catalan. So all of this contributes to the fact that for the next three centuries, there is very little Catalan literature. People are writing in Catalan in church records, in notaries, in, 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 all, in in more administrative ways, but not producing that much literature. Anyway, so when they come back, um, they, they're also the, the great unified theory experts. Ramon Yuen was the first philosopher to write in Catalan um, in the 12th, 13th century, and he, um, or the end, yeah, 12th, I was talking about. Um, he really, try to create a, uh, a theory of the universe. And the, the philosophers and thinkers who pick up on this kind of great unified vision of the world are Eugenie de Borses, as Enrique uh, mentioned, um, Francis Pujol, who is less well known than Morse, but quite fascinating, and, and Salvador Dali. So anyway, um, and there is, what, what emerges then is a rural, tradition as well in the, in the late 19th century. Um, while Verdeguet is writing this extraordinary poetry, um, novels are beginning to be written, and they're mostly written about the countryside, about the mountains, often about the peasants in Catalonia. Um, this gives rise to a reaction on the part of the Nocentistas of the 20th century, who um, are looking at seeking a, an urban novel or an urban, an urban culture, a more cosmopolitan culture, a more European culture, and who tend to put a lot of their, their the emphasis on, on writing poetry, though Eugenie does write, does write novels. So anyhow, what we have here is, is, a, is a very, very rich tradition on which these modern writers are, are drawing. And, and, a, and a series of traditions. The, the, the interesting thing about Villalonga and this novel that emerges in the Balearic Islands is that it is a, um, it's a novel of the aristocracy. And I think there isn't a, an equivalent <coughs> in Catalan literature. We, there are either rural, Mm, rural novels about mm, really about peasants or, or uh, the, the clash between the, the owners of the land and the peasants, and then there are there are 
there is a more urban culture. But in, in the case of Vinalonga, I think it's interesting to look at the, uh, a quote from, from Xavier Rubert de Ventoros, who's a distinguished Catalan philosopher of the late 20th century, who says that um, identity, he has a wonderful book called Nacionalismos, which also deserves to be translated, Nationalisms. It's a philosophical study of nationalism, not a defense. Um, and he says that, that identity is based on the five L's, which are language, linea, lineage, law, land, and lord. And all of these elements are, are present in, um, in Villa Longa. The, the language is Catalan, and maybe I think we'll talk a little bit about this later. Um, in fact, Villa Longa wrote in both, both in Spanish and Catalan, his relationship to Catalan and Catalan culture was uh, fraught. <laughs> um, and it's, there are doubts as to whether this book was written originally in Spanish and translated into Catalan or written originally in Catalan. In any case, he self-translated, so it's Villa Longa. But um, it's very interesting to read the, in, the translation by Deborah Bonner is extraordinary. And it really, really should be applauded. And you know, it's a great read. Um, the, the language, it's, there's a scene in the book that's really fantastic when this aristocrat who's accompanied the, uh, the doll's room is narrated by a, a priest who was the chaplain of the uh, Bayern family. Uh, the Bayern family are this, this decaying aristocratic family, actually the last generation of the family in, in Mallorca in the uh, late 19th century. So the, um, the priest narrates the, the novel, um, which allows to, um, a sort of winking at censorship because in fact the priest is continually suggesting all of these, the affairs that the aristocrat had and the strange things that go on. There are a lot of veiled references to homosexuality, to almost um, to cross-dressing. Um, but nothing is actually said and nothing is actually ever described. It's only suggested because it's this priest writing with pain in his heart to his uh, superior to just to tell the story of the legacy of Baron. So that's the, the, um, the conceit around which the, the novel is constructed. Um, in the case of the L of, that's the presence of Catholicism. Uh, the presence of the land is tremendous. The light, the sunlight of Mallorca, the, the presence of the water is all incredible. Lineage is, a, is an extraordinarily important part of this novel, more so than in many other novels, because you are really talking about the aristocracy. And it gives, um, it's a very interest, there's also a very interesting aspect of what a rural, rural novel might be because the, it, the novel gives the lie to the notion that these people were living absolutely isolated from the rest of the world. Uh, they are in Mallorca, they're on a small island, they, they're, it's an insular culture in every way, and, but the, this aristocrat um, has traveled throughout Paris and throughout, throughout Europe. They, uh, they visit Pope Leo the 13th and and Pope Leo the Thirteenth knows about his his writings as well. Um, it's very interesting how the the, the the great landscape of late nineteenth century culture in in an aristocratic in milieu of decaying aristocrats is is portrayed in an incredibly subtle and not on the nose way. So I'll stop there. I think um, I hope I'm giving you a sense of of what this book might be like, and I look forward to the <coughs> conversation. Thank you, Mary. Uh, thank you. Um, I would like to thank Ben for inviting me to participate in this uh, panel and to give me the opportunity to share with you my enthusiasm, my passion for uh, this Catalan author, Francesc Naval, and specifically uh, this novel, Walls, Bows, that unfortunately is uh, not uh, translated into 
English yet. I think it has never been translated. Uh, but I hope that in the in the, in the future, uh, some publisher will be interested in, in translate uh, this novel, and you can find it in the bookshops. Uh, Francis Traval is one of my favorite authors. Uh, besides Villa uh, Yonga, besides Pla, and um, besides another uh, important writer, Marcelo Dureda, uh, that maybe you already know. But Frances Traval, uh, his his work has has not has not been translated into uh, maybe in French, but. He has not. He, he has not uh, uh, translations, and this is one of the reasons that I, I want to talk to you about about this this author. Uh, he uh, was born in uh, an industrial city in Sabadell in the very at the, at the very end of the 19th century in 1899. Uh, Sabadell is a city not very far from Barcelona and an important one, an important city because uh, his industry. And he, he, was, uh, he belonged, belonged to a middle class family, so he was not uh, rich, he was not an aristocrat. He never uh, went to the university. Uh, he worked as a journalist. And he, he worked for different journals and newspapers. And he was a man that participated very actively in the cultural life of uh, his city, um, Sabadell. When, when he was, uh, I, 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 I am talking to you about his biography, because I, I think it's interesting to, to know uh, that he was really young when when he finally uh, wrote this work that I think is a masterpiece, and and because his biography, it's important uh, to to understand the kind of interest that he has he had in in literature, because he was uh, he went to France when he was uh, 24. Uh, where uh, he met uh, his woman, but he also uh, met uh, some writers as Cocteau and Jean, and he read uh, authors like uh, Proust that will influence uh, his prose. So he published his, his first novel when he was 30 in 1929, uh, but uh, his, I think his most important novel was, it was published in 1936, the year that the Spanish Civil War uh, began. So during the war, he, he stayed in, in Barcelona, I think. Barcelona uh, and work very, very, he was very active with the Catalan Writers Association. But at the end of the war, he, he, take, uh, he, he went to exile. Uh, and he went first to, to France and then to Chile, uh, where he died when he was uh, 50 years old. So this novel was is about bourgeoisie, <coughs> it's about uh, youth, and it tells the story of a young man, uh, Zeni, uh, that is uh, the son of the, uh, a bourgeois family, uh, the old bourgeoisie, mm? and uh, he is in his uh, 20s, he falls in love uh, with the uh, older woman. And because this uh, impossible love, 
he began to be involved in different uh, sentimental, sometimes sexual, but not always, relationships with um, younger women. And all the novel is uh, this uh, uh, it, it explains explains what what happened to him and about his ideas, his hopes, and how uh, his life um, became a waltz. Hmm? A waltz where uh, he's always dancing and dancing, but unable to commit, commit to any to any woman. <coughs> so what I what I really like of, of, of this novel is that they told us this story about youth, about bourgeoisie, about uh, its miseries, uh, in a very modern way. I think this work is a, is a novel is a novel related uh, with some parts of uh, uh, La Chat de Perdue uh, by Bruce. And uh, his character uh, remembers me. Um, for one hand, uh, the character of Werther of Goethe, but on the other hand, also uh, the character of the Torrents of Spring by Ivan Turgenev, and even uh, some some character of. of of Proust, no? and, and the way he he tells us the story uh, is very modern in his structure. Uh, so, because he was very influenced by uh, French symbolism, and but the European authors that uh, at that very moment uh, were uh, trying to to write novels in in a, in a different way of the 19th century. So uh, I hope I, I, uh, I, I convince you that is a, <laughs> is a novel that deserves to be, to be translated and of course to be any. Well, I'd like to thank uh, Penn for the invitation and to, well, specifically to Dolby Archive, uh, Martin Rica and uh, Edwin Franks from the, the New York Review of Books. Um, publishers who are publishing translations of, of, of Catalan, Catalan classics. And I think that um, before I talk about El Padre and Greece, I, 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 I'd, I'd like to say that it, it does seem that at last a number of publishers in the, in the United States and the United Kingdom are commissioning translations of contemporary uh, Catalan writing and writing by uh, the, 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 well, the classics of the, 20th, of the 20th century, which means that within uh, over the next three or four years, uh, you will be able to read uh, a range of Catalan writing that has never been available before uh, in English. And in editions that are being published by um, uh, 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 leading li leading publishers, not by small university presses or by. I mean, many many works in in, uh, in the second half of the uh, 20th century that were published, uh, the translations from Catalan came out with uh, very very small university presses who had no kind of budget for for, for promotion or um, uh, published by enthusiasts in the Anglo-Catalan Society in the United Kingdom or in the United States, which was fine because they, they, they created a, a, a visibility for Catalan literature, but it, it kind of didn't reach uh, a, a, a very wide audience. And I think that this will change over, over the, ne the, ne the next few years. Um, I'm just finishing the first draft of this uh, work by uh, Josette Platt, the, the, great, the great Notebook. 
I'm, back, I'm not kind of read, read from it. I just wanted to talk about about, about this uh, work, which I, I think is an astonishing uh, uh, piece of writing. I, I would say it's one of the um, the great works of the 20th century of autobiographical writing. Um, as as Enrique Boas mentioned, he he wrote it uh, between March 1918 and November 1919. Uh, in, his, his, the first version, as it were, when he was when he was only 21, and then revisited it later in his life, and it was uh, first published in, in, in 1966, and um, it's a work in, in, in which is in the form of a diary, uh, in which the diary entries are full of um, reminiscences, of flashbacks, of um, of narrative sequences which are almost like short stories, uh, art line in fact short stories uh, based on real, his, real, his real experience. But with all of this within a framework of uh, uh, well, the time he was writing, uh, the end of, the, the, end of the, the, the First World War, which the First World, First World War was in many ways seen by uh, Catalan, the Catalan bourgeoisie and the Spanish bourgeoisie as a good thing because they were not involved in the war and they made lots of money out of uh, uh, producing things for both sides. Anyway, should I go on? <laughs> and, uh, and the, and the, the, the Russian, the, 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 the the aftermath of the Russian Revolution and the impact of that within within Spain and within specifically within Barcelona, with the development of uh, trade union strikes and uh, kind of revolutionary um, impulses within, within within Barcelona and the industrial cities of uh, of, of, of Catalonia. And he himself uh, was born in Palafrugal. Oh, thank you. <laughs> he himself was born in uh, in Palafrugel on the uh, in, uh, on the Costa Brava, um, into a family that, that uh, wasn't particularly well off, although it was a well-established family. His, one of his grandfathers was a farmer, and another a a, 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 a blacksmith. Uh, I um, and he uh, <coughs> describes. The life in the life in, Palo, in the life in Palafrugell, the life in the in the in the fishing uh, villages along the coast of the Costa Brava, um, and his, the circle of his family and the circle of his uh, immediate friends and, and the, the the kind of conversations, the the, the, the landscape uh, of of the of the of, of the, uh, the mountains, uh, the seascapes. Um, the life in the bars, uh, the intellectual conversations, the petty struggles in the small town, in the, in the, in the small town, and the the, the, the the kind of difficult life he had uh, with, with, I mean, relationship with, with, with in fact, with, with his family. Um, and he he went to so, so there are several centres, if you like, within within this uh, within this book, several spaces. One is Palafrugel and the Costa Brava, and another is Barcelona, where he went to university. And, uh, and another is Girona, uh, the city where he, was, uh, where he went to boarding school for, 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 for some time. And uh, <coughs> within Barcelona, he, I mean, in Barcelona, he was a student. Um, he was a very unhappy student in terms of the university. Um, he hated the university. Um, there are magnificent pages of descriptions of the mediocrity of the University of Barcelona. Um, there are something like four wonderful pages on the horrors of cramming. The word empollar, uh, in fact a Castilian word, a Spanish word that, that, that he uses, in which they, the, the, the students uh, had to learn everything off by heart and then regurgitate in the, in the exams. They went to lecture theatres. Uh, they went to lectures where the professor would spend half an hour of the hour of the lecture time reading out the list of the students present. Uh, uh, the, the, 
the lack of what he says, any enthusiasm for the experience of learning, which should be at the centre of a university, was totally lacking in the University of, of, of Barcelona, with the exception of one or two rather eccentric professors uh, who, who, who appealed to him and obviously made some effort to teach their students. But they were, but, and he, uh, he, he, he had no money. Uh, he, he describes this kind of cramming process that students would have. They would be in their, in their small uh, lodging houses in bed with only a, a, a wardrobe, the unmade bed, the little wooden table with uh, and the ashtray full of fag ends, bud ends, sorry, um, and, and the, 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 the cups of coffee that they would take in order to kind of empoyar, to cram their, their, their minds throughout the night, but shivering with cold because they had no money to pay for, uh, for, 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 for heating. And all this, for what purpose? Uh, however, the other side of his experience in, in Barcelona was that he, he became involved with, with, the, with the, the, the intellectuals and writers in the, in the Ateneo, the Athenium of, of, of Barcelona, with the, 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 the people who were really in touch with intellectual literary trends within not just Europe, but within, within the whole world. And, and uh, he was able to become part of a, of a tertulia, of a regular conversation uh, with, uh, um, it was then um, organized by a man called Dr. Dr. Burayeras, who introduced him to, to Proust. Um, <coughs> and the, the uh, <coughs> so let's say something about the Girona experience, because there are um, some hilarious scenes uh, of life, his life in Girona, as, as well, hilarious and sad. Uh, uh, the hilarious one is when he, he and his mates, uh, scarper off from school early one day, and they go, they go and wander into the into the woods, as Catalan uh, Catalans like to wander into woods and look for mushrooms and things. Anyway, so they wander in, in into the woods, and then they rush back. Um, because they're going to pay a visit to a brothel. And they, they knock on the door of the brothel and there's this kind of very horrible woman who lets them in and it's a, it's a, it's a kind of downtown, uh, not, it's not a very smart brothel. Um, and they sit there feeling embarrassed, wondering what's going to happen. And in fact, nothing happens because of course the, the, the people working in the brothel realize that these are school kids, they're not going to have any money and there's not much future. Future. So after this kind of very embarrassed uh, few minutes in the brothel, they all sheepishly kind of uh, leave and, 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 and go go home. But he he kind of describes this this uh, this this late afternoon experience of these youngsters in a very ironic, uh, humorous humorous way. And then uh, through his family, he's invited to to have lunch with a. With a with a, a, a shopkeeper and his wife, um, and one of the people that is invited to this lunch, I think it's a Sunday lunch that he's invited, and he's glad to get out because you know they they kind of locked in this in this boarding school, and that, it's not it's not very fun, and the food isn't uh, anything to write home about, so he's very pleased to be invited to this Sunday lunch, and there's a politician um, having having lunch, and the uh, the shop the shop owner says. He has a, an assistant in the shop who is, uh, he's noticed, is, uh, is taking money out of the till. And uh, the politician and the shop owner discuss in front of why this, this, this schoolboy is there. What they should, you know, what, what, what should they do? And the politician, who is a right-wing conservative politician, advises the shopkeeper to let him get on with it. To let the, let the boy, let, let, the, let the shop assistant carry on uh, taking things out of the till, and then, when he's really kind of uh, uh, established his his existence as a as a, shop, as a shop assistant and as a thief, then to catch him and to expose him, and this really uh, upsets the young Josette Platt, and he kind of thinks, well, what can I do about it? And what he, he does about it is eventually he kind of contacts the parents who are who are poor farmers, 
and uh, he says you should take your, you must take your son out of the shop as soon as, as, soon as possible. Um, so it, it's kind of told as a, as, a, as a sort of almost like a short story in, re in, in retrospect within one of the entries in the diary. And this is really the, 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 tone, the, the tone of the narrative. Um, I'd like to say something about the style uh, Giuseppe's uh, Giuseppe Plastein is because really uh, in this work and in, in many volumes of his, uh, his complete works and his, ri his writings, he was fashioning uh, what is the basis of, I think, modern literary Catalan. Um, he was in reaction against the, the, the writers that have been mentioned, the Nusentistas, who were obsessed with, with uh, um, creating a Catalan that was rather museum-like. They loved writing an obscure Catalan. They loved using kind of outdated words, archaic, archaic words, which was fine in some of their writings and it works. But, but Platt wanted to produce writing that would be read and that would create an enjoyment of reading in, 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 in his readership. And what, what, what one gets out of, of, of reading the Platt in Greece is a feeling of fantastic confidence that he has with Catalan. This Platt Catalan is a Catalan that isn't feeling threatened. It isn't a Catalan that feels that it's going to be dying out. It's a Catalan that he writes uh, with extreme uh, brilliance, uh, using all kinds of using all kinds of registers, uh, in which he can include a, a, a kind of a very subtle description of, of his reactions to his first reading of uh, *Alors je cherche du temps perdu*. But at the same time, he can relate his conversations with the fishermen on the beaches because he is a great fan of rowing in the, in the, in the seas off the, off the Costa Brava, off the, the coast near Bagur and Aigua Brava. And, and, and uh, so you have a whole range of registers of Catalan within, within, within this one book. Uh, a range of tones, ironic, lyrical, tragic, philosophical. He's very self-reflective. Um, he's never... I mean, it's 350,000 words, 700 pages, and he never descends into uh, merely telling you the customs or into into folk into you know. There's a great love of the folk of the folkloric in 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 Spain and, and outside of Spain. There is a great love of the folkloric within Spain. When he never his writing isn't about the folkloric. It's at an entirely different level. So that is why I would say that this is one of the great works of the 20th century in, in the way that it combines, he describes these many different sites of Catalan culture, the conflicts within a, at a political level, at a family level, at a cultural level, in the literary circles, um, the moods. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's an extremely subtle um, kaleidoscope of a diary autobiography that is rewritten it's so, it, it, in, in its way, it is, it is, he is recreated à la, tom, à la recherche du temps perdu, but in the form that, 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 that is very, very... Uh, I'll just mention this and finish, that um, Jill Schoolman at the, uh, <coughs> at the Archipelago Press has, has commissioned me to translate what is the next major work that was written by Platt, because the Quadern Gris is... is, is his experience in Catalonia. As Enrique mentioned, um, I mean, when he finished uh, writing the first version, when he finished his <coughs> university degree, he uh, was able to, he, he was, through his contacts at the Ateneo, he was able to get a, a, a job as a journalist. And he was immediately, I mean, he sent to Madrid, but through to cities throughout Europe. And from, so from 1919 to 1939, he was a foreign correspondent for for, for Catalan newspapers. Um, and he wrote a, 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 a book called La Vida Amarga, um, which I'll be translating for the Archipelago Press, which are 24 short stories. And the short stories are set in different cities in, 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 in Europe. And each story has a, has a, a kind of human interest, there is a, um, but, but each story reflects the kind of uh, the political social tensions within the city where he is the foreign correspondent. So, for instance, the one uh, set in Berlin is, you know, reflects the the, the rise of, of Hitler and Nazism. 
and so on and so forth. And I think it's very interesting that he should go from writing his book that is very, if you like, Catalan-centered in, in its content, to write, to write this book of short stories that is totally European in content. Yes. But again, the inst his instrument is this wonderful use of Catalan, the Catalan that he, that he writes. So. Thank you. Thank you. I'm wondering, as I'm listening to you, that, um, and it's interesting to me personally for a number of reasons, but the Catalan language is in a position of being a minority language in a majority uh, Spanish-speaking country. And then if you add all the other Spanish-speaking countries, um, there is a, there is a difficult situation, or maybe not difficult, but challenging, um, in that the writer writing in Catalan has a different kind of responsibility that is right as in Spanish, well, you, need to, you don't have to worry about you know, the responsibility toward the language or the relationship with the tradition because it's going to go on with or without them. Um, I'm wondering what is the position or situation of the contemporary Catalan <coughs> in relation to the language, um, in relation to the tradition that needs to be uh, repeatedly endorsed. Um, what are the challenges, what are the advantages, and what are the disadvantages of writing in Catalan today? Where well, wants to go first? Mm -hmm. Let me go first. <laughs> Just briefly, I think uh, there are two problems that have already been more or less been discussed here. One is the uh, the choice of a language uh, to write with, uh, because uh, of course for many uh, language uh, uh, writers are uh, bilingual or can write uh, in both languages, in Spanish and Catalan. But it's uh, a personal and almost political decision. But at the same time, uh, editorial. No? Uh, you have many network, many more possibilities of being known, of being published, of making money. If you uh, publish in Spanish, you have a larger audience uh, than if you uh, write in, in Catalan. But I think uh, more and more, uh, the, because of the changes in Spain after Franco's death, I, I didn't go that far as, but uh, things have changed dramatically you know, since, since the Civil War, the dictatorship. And more and more, uh, people have this, uh, decided to stay uh, with their own language, uh, that is uh, Catalan. Uh, the second one would be that something that uh, uh, Peter mentioned is the, the fact that uh, the choice of in which language to write. And, and, and he started with uh, probably he was the first one to really uh, present and discuss the, the problem uh, quite open in a wide open way. And uh, it's uh, it's which and, and, and more and more uh, contemporary writers are this time are trying are fighting. Uh, to create, to uh, uh, use a language that is close to what's uh, spoken in the streets. So the, the situation has also changed dramatically thanks to the uh, advent of television or media uh, writing, uh, TV series, soap operas, etc. In Catalan, Catalan TV, uh, which has uh, uh, presented the, the possibility for many writers that have to have a dual career. No? The best known example of this would be Papito uh, Vanetti, who has a, he's a very well known. Um, a playwright, a playwright, but also he has uh, he has uh, had this tremendous, uh, very popular career as, uh, and he has incorporated what and uh, invented, made up new words or situations for the use of the language. So I would, uh, I would uh, remind this though, the choice of language, you know, political, personal, sentimental, also the, the which language, which level, which sophistication we use when writing. And <clears throat> I actually am not sure people actually have a choice. Um, I think one of the paradoxes of the, some of the authors we're talking about, uh, Villalonga and, and Pla in particular, but also Mercedes Rivera, is that their, some of their greatest works come out under Franco. Uh, so that even when it was absolutely, you know, not, not at all favorable to be writing in Catalan, they were writing in Catalan. And Najat Alhaji mentioned yesterday, she's one of the Catalan authors uh, here today with Mr. Rezalan Solana. She said, well, I, I, you know, Catalan chooses you to a certain extent. I hope I'm, I'm quoting you correctly. So I think, you know, I'm, there's a certain extent that it's almost like uh, sexual orientation, I think. I'm, I'm not sure how many people it, choose to write in Spanish because it's um, uh, to their 
Yeah, uh, you said that uh, Catalan is, uh, is in a difficult situation. <coughs> I, I think that it's not only in a difficult situation, it's in a real danger uh, to disappear. So uh, different writers think different about what's the, the solution. And some writers are very worried about uh, the, the necessity to preserve the language the purity of the language, uh, and to recover all words. And uh, that means that sometimes in Catalan literature, in contemporary Catalan literature, there is a gap between the language used by writers and language uh, that people use, uh, sp speaks uh, in the streets. So, uh, in my case, uh, what I do is I, I try <coughs> to reflect in my novels the real Catalan that people speak. That is not a pure Catalan, not at all. It's a Catalan with a lot of uh, Spanish words, uh, Spanish... Uh, uh, the translation of, to, into Catalan of Spanish uh, translations. So it's, it's, it's a... It's a it's not pure in that sense that, that some people like purity in, in languages, no? Uh, probably for you it's, it's not easy to understand that because in English you don't have an academy, you don't have rules, and nobody uh, tells to the writer what he can or he cannot write. But in languages like uh, Spanish, French, or Catalan, we have academies and we have critics and people that uh, try to tell us, the writers, what we can or we can not say in our novels. So I think the role of the, of the writer is not uh, to teach a language, mm. it's to tell stories. And if your choice is not to give a voice uh, to the people that doesn't speak proper uh, at all that. Uh, it's also a political choice mm -hmm. because these characters are not in, in, the, in the contemporary novels. So, but anyway, I, I think, I, I know that it's, it's, it's difficult. Uh, it's difficult because it's, it's a difficult situation and I, I understand that other writers have a different, a different approach uh, and they decide uh, not to to put for any words or in in this model. Thank you. Yeah, I, can I just say? I, well, I I I was just say briefly that that, that um, and uh, similar to Teresa really, that, that um, there's this is a difficulty of uh, uh, this fear. It, it's as if writers uh, there's a policeman inside the you know we talk about censorship. Um, but it's as if in Catalonia there, there, is a, there is a policeman inside writer's head saying, you must not use that word because it is a calc on Spanish. Um, and the critic, when he writes a review of your novel, will point out that you don't write proper Spanish. Uh, or you don't use your pronouns properly. Uh, this, you know, the, 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 the writer writes and draws on all ranges of, of language, and that's why I, what I said about Platt. With Platt, there, there, there's no policeman inside Plasnet. These policemen have come after the Civil War in the transition, and, 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 and now it seems to me that this policeman inside writers' heads in, in, in Catalonia, they're very dangerous people. I think they're the, that, that's the danger to the development of Catalan, because it, it's also, there's a kind of class thing here as well, in that the, the, there are two generations of, of Catalan speakers who did, weren't educated in Catalan. So they find it difficult to, to write in Catalan and difficult to read. <coughs> and the writers who, uh, you know, that this policeman is saying, ignore that issue, ignore that issue, ignore the Catalan that these people are using, um, and write a Catalan that these people won't be interested in reading anyway. Uh, and, and I think that the, 
you know, in, in the situation that we have now in Catalonia, there are a number of writers who are, are kind of fighting against the policemen in their heads. But it, it's, it's a daily battle, and it's a battle that carries on with editors, the, the, the copy editors. Um, I, mean, it, it, I mean, some of the things that, some of the things that writers face in, the, in terms of editing are absurd. An English writer, an American writer, never has to worry about this. You know, I mean, the, you know we're, how would James Calvin ever write in, you know, in Catalan? Uh, he would never get, never get published. <laughs> um, I think we have time for at least one question. Um, I go ahead first. Sorry. sorry, mine will be quick. Um, a year or two ago at the same festival, there was a great event of Catalan authors, and there was a pamphlet, almost a small book that was given out free that seemed to be from a government cultural institution that was uh, both classic Catalan authors and contemporary translated. And so it seemed that there was government funding for translation. And uh, it's the Institute of Ramon and it, they, they did fund Peter's translation and, and this translation. There's that's the question. Okay. Did you all hear the question? Now that we heard the answer. <laughs> Hi, I'm I'm a translator that mostly focuses on Catalan to English translation. In fact, I'm working for you right now. I got a piece that's coming up in your, in your next anthology. My name is Jan Reinhardt. Uh, I've been uh, working with Catalan for a number of years, and it, ten years ago, I felt like there was this point where the Catalan Catalan authors had lost confidence in that there was any future to the language. You had Kim Munzo saying it's time to put it out of its misery and writing only in Spanish for a while. You had uh, Aldo de la Lengua. He never wrote only in Spanish. Well, for that, for that mm -hmm. column that he was doing for, for Mundo. No, Kim Munzo writes for La Vanguardia. La Vanguardia. But his, his, his literature is in Catalan. Well, he was expressing a lot of, dis of despair about the future of the language. Uh, yes. Ferran Turen looking to switch to Spanish. And among, yeah, well, he's a pot boiler. But anyways, uh, now I don't think, I don't feel the same sense of despair. I feel like there's, that the language is kind of turning a corner. And the, and the authors, there's a lot more confidence. There's even people who aren't even Catalan writing in Catalan, like Matthew Tree and uh, Najat al uh, am, Is my impression correct, or am I just being too optimistic? Did you answer the question? <laughs> yeah. Okay. I think, uh, if I may. You are right in being a little bit more optimistic than maybe 10, 15 years ago, because some things have, have changed. Uh, one uh, could be the, the, I don't know, the, the Sudanist uh, term, the, also the winning streak by Barca, that's helping a lot. Uh, and, but no, but seriously, I think it's the, the new generations and the, this, this, uh, this uh, also uh, Catalan Barcelona society has changed a lot in the sense that there are many more non Catalan. Which are an example for other uh, writers, but uh, I think that the, one of the problems is the, the also that the, this uh, has been mentioned before. This uh, situation of Diaglossia and Fernando Kimuzo, he has to write in his uh, the bread making, uh, no, the, the, his articles in Spanish, but then his uh, creation, uh, his real literature in Spanish, which is the same that had to uh, Jeff Pla, for example. This also doesn't help, no, in the, but, but in any case, going back to your question, I think it, it's, it's changed a little bit. No? There was also this uh, movement of uh, linguists, social linguists, very pessimistic, uh, saying that, well, in five more years, uh, Catalanists will happen to I think nobody's saying this. There are no new books published in that direction. So it's a sign of the five years some hope. <laughs> <laughs> may, may I make one uh, last comment? I think um, it, it's a literary comment, but I think one of the it has to do with what Peter was talking about. I think Pla and Villa, Villa Longa and, and Rodoveda had such a normal Catalan that they didn't need the police, you know, and um, they knew how to use the, the complicated weak pronouns and all of that. Um, clearly, a writer should not be uh, censored if he or she wants to reflect the, the daily language um, you must be able to write whatever, however you see fit, but the problem is that some people, if they wanted to write the correct register, wouldn't know how, you know, which is not your case, but it's the case. I, I think it's a little bit unfair 
to, to see this as a kind of uh, police state because of, because of that interruption and you know, the difficulty of learning, learning to write. Um, but the other, the other thing I wanted to, to mention in, in when you're talking about folklore and not, mm -hmm. not folklore is the, um, the what Plot and Fida Lunga are describing our kind of ancestral lifestyle, but they're doing it in a modern way and they're making it available to modern readers. And, and what Shaval does is that too, because there's, there's an extraordinary juxtaposition of, of traditional life. You know, there's a moment when these conscripts are being taken off to, to war, and you hear their, their espadrilles, their hemp sandals, shuffling along under the moonlight, and yet at the same time, the, um, the young guy, Zeni, is one of his affairs he, may, he carries on entirely by telephone. So, so this kind of you know modern and traditional, and going back to the to the topic of the uh, um, is is always there, and it may even be there in this language thing. I mean, is it, who who polices the the language? I think we have time for one more question. Uh, how does Barcelona, in promoting itself as a global city, promote its language, or does it? Did you hear the question? Is there an answer? <laughs> I don't think they have an official language policy. It's not the city's duty to do that, I would say. But I'm not a representative of the city council, so I can't. I, would, I think that by representing Barcelona, they try to make cut on available. I guess we'll have another yes. question there. Um, I'd like to ask um, a practical question. It's mainly for Marianne Newman and, and Peter Bush. Uh, it's about publishing. You know, how do you how do you go about publishing Catalan literature? What kind of publishers are interested in it? Is it like uh, the mainstream corporate publishers, or main, or mo mostly, I would say, like um, like um, independent publishers? How much? How many copies could be sold? You know. What kind of copyright is there, and uh, you know these kind of these kind of questions because you know we were uh, we were talking in, in all kinds of workshops here and uh, and panels about translating uh, different uh, different literatures into English, and uh, so somebody said or many different people told told us that um, it was only like less than one percent of translation um, out of the, the whole of um, publishing in English, okay? So less than 1%. So I mean, for Catalan, it must be like, I don't know, a very, very small percentage. So how do you know about it? Do you offer your own translations? Or do you, how, how does it work? We, we should say that this is not also a Catalan novelist, Monica Zubova, so Czech Catalan novelist. <laughs> I, I have a triple identity. Triple. <laughs> I, I, I'd like to say that, 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 that I mean, you know, Catalan is, no, is really no different from any other foreign literature in terms of the English speaking world. I mean, uh, I think it's slightly more than 1%. I mean, the, 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 you know, like between 2 and 3% of what is published in the English speaking world is in translation. And so, that, what does that mean? It means that all foreign literatures within the English-speaking world are in a minority position. And it may be that more books have translated, and it's true, that more books have translated from Spanish and French than are published from, than are translated from Catalan. But it's a very small number of books. Um, so, you know, um, ca 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 I mean, what I said about Catalan over the next few years, I mean, I think as a result of uh, some of the activities of the uh, of, of, of the of the Ramon, Ramon Lu Center. They they they've invited publishers to come to Barcelona to meet writers, uh, to meet publishers, to meet translators. Um, they, they 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 kind of send writers abroad. They, 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 I mean, there is an official uh, move, uh, impulse there to to sell Catalan literature abroad, and, and that, 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 that that to a certain extent has worked. And then individual translators, you know, yes, you, you write reports, you do a sample translation, you think what publisher might like this book of you, and you have a go. Um, I mean, with, with Najat, uh, Najat's The Last pa Patriarch, when I read it, I thought, this is a great book. I'll, I'll write a report, and it's a book for Serpent's Tale. So I sent the report to Serpent's Tale to Peter, and 
the, the publisher there, and he, he liked the, the, the report, and he took the report and argued it through with, with his, you know, the, edit, the, ed, the other editors in his publishing house, and they decided to buy the rights for it. And that happens a lot with, in, in, the, in the English-speaking world with translations. You know, that's, it's translators that uh, sometimes are the gatekeepers, but not always. You write lots of reports, and you, know, you don't even get a reply back, <laughs> even from the publishers who you, you know them quite well. <laughs> but what has changed is the, is the movement of the independent presses, and there's just, there are places you know you can go to, you, there are places to whom you feel a certain confidence that if you write a report, they're going to read it and take it seriously. And people like Alki, Open Letter, Europa, Archipelago, you know, there are places we can go to now where before it was sort of, okay, shall I send this to for our Strauss? You know, I mean, I mean, that would be wonderful, but, but at least you know, and of course the, the policy of making sure that the books will stay in print, which uh, Dalkey does, and I believe Open Letter does, that's, that's essential because these books, you know, there may be a question of word of mouth. This book was translated in 1987. Uh, it's been republished now, and it will be available, and somebody may give it, you know, do it in a course someday, and somebody might discover it and make it a bestseller, and it will be there. And that's an incredible thing. Well, on that positive note, <laughs> we need to finish. Thank you all for coming, and please join me in thanking our guests.